Now, to kick off the conference, uh, it is my great honor to introduce a, a wonderful individual uh, by the name of Aparna Vincantesum. Aparna has been pushing boundaries for decades. She was the first female undergraduate to earn a degree from Cornell's University Astronomy Department in the 1990s. As an aside, I cannot quite believe it took them that long to graduate a woman out of that department. Uh, but since then, she's been a champion for women and minorities in science-related careers. She now chairs the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of uh, San Francisco, where she studies the first stars and quasars in the universe. She has been recognized as a visionary change maker in the Vice's Humans 2020 list and has dedicated much of her time over the last 18 months advocating for the inclusion of indigenous and marginalized voices in the current rush to industrialize space. Thank you, Aparna, for joining us. It's such a great honor uh, for you to come and kick off this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruskin. And um, hello, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Hello, everybody. What an honor and delight to be here today with you all as we come together for IDA's 2021 Under the Sky event. I hope to share with you my thoughts and shared advocacy avenues on the current pressing issue of who owns the night sky and how we can have the sky be for all people. I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging those whose ancestral homelands I am speaking on, the Coast Miwok and Ohlone of Northern California, and the traditional custodians of the land where each of you are. I express profound gratitude to the IDA leadership, including Ruskin and many cherished colleagues for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I express gratitude to all of you, the IDA community, our hearts and minds and hands at work together for our shared skies. And I express gratitude to all of you joining us today. This has been a really hard last 20 months, more than any of us could have anticipated in the early days of the pandemic. And I don't know what your work or life or school package has been or what losses you have endured, but thank you for being here today and for caring. There have been so many kinds of losses, but I especially want to take a minute to acknowledge the loss of elders, whether they be human elders of which we have lost too many or elders in the form of redwoods, the devastating fires in Northern California, all around where I live in San Francisco, who are so awful. And to watch the elders of the redwoods fall in a year we had lost too many elders was so devastating. And also we had other elder losses, such as Arecibo, the elder telescope of our time. When it fell, all of our hearts broke. So I wanna invite you all to take a moment to write the name or names of those you are mourning, they could be elders or otherwise, and the countries they are from. Let us connect through our shared loss and also through our shared love of the skies. Because after all, space and the skies are our ultimate common shared ancestor. I don't want to ask you guys to put yourself out there on your own. I will add myself to that. My own father, a beloved life elder, passed at the start of the pandemic at New Moon Phase, or in Sanskrit, Amavase. Since then, I have more than ever observed the phase of the moon and felt a deeply personal connection. The moon has become my personal grief calendar since the loss of my beloved father. The moon and the universe and the skies have never felt more personal to me. I don't need to tell you about the existential crossroads that we are at. 
we are really facing as a species, as an, as a planet, a dramatically accelerating fallout from all of these factors impacting our very survival. I want to point out explicitly that many, if not all of these, are born disproportionately by the same communities. Whether it be climate change, whose impacts are accelerating quickly around the world in many, many forms, pandemics of which we are still navigating one, economic inequality, racial injustices, the digital divide, which the pandemic has accelerated into a digital chasm, we have never been more keenly aware of the need for global affordable broadband. The health of the ocean is very much at stake as is clean water access, as well as all the systemic hurdles for all of us to achieve our best. And among all of these crises, it is so easy to feel exhausted to be in a state of crisis fatigue. And it's easy, therefore, to miss a crisis that is quietly unfolding above us in space, which I will spend a lot of my talk on. I want to also express that instead of just saying there's so much crisis, there's so much bad stuff going on, I want to offer hope. And let us view this existential crossroads also as an opportunity that we are invited to, to rethink, reimagine, and co-create from all human ways of knowing so that we can be integrative. Let us integrate everything that is good, that is creative about being human. Let us be relational, let us be ethical, and co-create from all human ways of knowing so that we can collectively achieve new outcomes perhaps even ones that surprise us uh, that we did not anticipate as we journey together on earth and through space. Today is the closing day of the Climate Change Summit in Glasgow, Scotland. And I know many of you are joining us from there. Today's the last day of COP26. And I draw your attention to the issue of climate change and rising sea levels. This is only one of many ways that climate change is manifesting, but it has a close connection to the communities who are experiencing many of the existential crises a couple of slides ago. So for a minute, I am going to play this video, but I'm also going to ask uh, uh, the IDA staff, Betty Maya, if you could drop in the YouTube link and that way people can watch it on their own if their bandwidth doesn't permit a stream. In Tuvalu, we are living the realities of climate change, sea level rise, as you stand watching me today at COP26. We cannot wait for speeches when the sea is rising around us all the time. Climate mobility must come to the forefront. We must take bold, alternative action today to secure tomorrow. Paftailasi Tuvalu Modetua. So I mentioned this explicitly um, as this, uh, the foreign minister of Tuvalu, Simon Kofi, and just about an hour before this event began, Tuvalu's climate minister spoke forcefully at COP26, delivering the message of we are sinking and we must raise the level of ambition and the mitigation. I mentioned this explicitly because the IDA has played such a key role, a wonderful role in being a global leader in recognizing and supporting dark sky communities, dark sky areas, dark sky parks, even dark sky nations. The first dark sky nation was the Kaiba Paiut, dark sky nation recognized on Earth Day in 2015. And more recently, just about 1100 miles southeast of the beautiful island nation of Tuvalu is the beautiful island nation of Niue, the world's second dark sky nation. And I draw attention to this because the IDA has played such a wonderful role 
in dark skies, in fighting light pollution, but also access to safe lighting um, and designating protection for land, sea, and sky. But how far can we continue this protection if the ocean levels are rising? How far can we continue this protection if they are rising not just on Earth, but the light pollution is rising in the ocean above us, space? So this is the challenge before us that all of us and the IDA are rising to. I want to start by honoring once more space as our common ancestor, the ocean above us. We know that we, all 8 billion of us and all life forms, are the broadest constituency. We are not a special interest group. It's all of us. The sky belongs to all of us. It impacts all of us. And all of us, through our ancestral traditions, as well as traditions that are specific to us as individuals or our individual cultures, have practices, be they scientific, cultural, or just connecting, we have worldwide practices with our shared skies. And as we begin to advocate for the skies and space, a recurring theme will be the duty to consult, which I'll amplify in just a moment and everything that raises. So what is this challenge to light pollution, not just on the ground, but from above? As I've already said, there's been this building crisis, but it's been lost in the noise until relatively recently uh, because there's been so much going on. I mean, the uh, island nation of Niue was designated the second dark sky nation on March 7th, 2020. And look at everything that's happened since then. So what is this crisis? I'm gonna focus particularly on the escalating, dramatically growing number of satellites in low earth orbits or LEOs. You might see that when you read articles or people talk about it, which right now are hovering at about a few thousand, which by the way, is one of the highest numbers that's ever been. It's at a few thousand, but it's predicted to grow to well over 100,000 by 2030. And frankly, given the rate of filings we are seeing, uh, it's probably going to be achieved a lot sooner than that. Now, I want to say that at just a few percent of what's planned, the effect has already been noticeable and dramatic. And I also want to say that it's not without its potential gains. We know that the digital divide, which has now become a digital chasm, is something we need to address. And global affordable broadband is one of the promises of these satellite mega constellations. They also aim for other lofty goals, such as the democratization of space and other things that, in principle, we are all for. However, it remains to be seen whether these early promises are actually achieved. What are the economics of achieving this global affordable broadband? Are we all going to be able to afford it? We all know that this is a stepping stone to much more, for example, asteroid mining, lunar bases. Uh, it's the same players, the same private actors in space. And the question is how much of this will really benefit all of humanity especially the most under-resourced, the most minoritized communities. So whether or not these all actually come to pass as the dreams that they are stated to be, they are coming at a high cost. And the rate at which things are being launched is it, the number of satcons in space is quickly approaching the point of no return. And my question is, is this the only way we can achieve this bridging of the digital divide and the democratization of space? Because the fallout is enormous. There's an enormous environmental fallout. The implications for space debris and a potential Kessler syndrome are enormous. And there is a significant loss of dark skies at stake, both from a scientific perspective for professional astronomers such as myself, for cultural traditions, for human health, for ecological health, and just plain human connection and enjoyment of dark skies. There's already, again, at just a few percent of what's planned, an enormous fallout. 
So to give you a sense, and if that uh, second link could be dropped into chat, I'd be so grateful in case, again, your bandwidth does not permit this. Here's a little video made in 2020. And although made just a year ago, it's already outdated. Um, showing, and here it's the year, and <clears throat> the planned satellites to go into orbit around Earth. And note, by the time it gets to the mid to late 2020s, how very crowded it gets. And please know that after this video was made, many more tens, even hundreds of thousands of satellites uh, have been filed uh, in order to get clearance to launch. So again, I don't know how many of these will actually end up there, but this was the plan as of a year ago, this kind of cage that we're already fighting to get in and out of. So again, these are some of the challenges we are facing as we begin to look at the impact on our shared skies. Okay. Now, there's been growing advocacy, uh, including through the IDA and many other national and international groups on how to really address this. I want to honor that there's been a series of conferences and workshops. Remember, this issue burst into like the global radar and onto like onto in the global stage uh, and into our consciousness really only two and a half years ago. I know this year has been so aging. Every week feels like a month, maybe even a year, but really it's May 2019. And initially, there was a SATCON 1 workshop a year ago, summer of 2020, and more recently, this past summer, in, um, in July of 2021, the SATCON 2 workshop that it was my honor to participate in. So I should also honor a number of other meetings, including the United Nations, Dark and Quiet Skies, but particularly SATCON 2 targeted the issues under four working groups, observations, algorithms, policy, and community engagement, which it was my honor to co-chair along with my wonderful co-chair, James Lowenthal from Smith College. Many of my SATCON2 colleagues uh, have deep ties to the IDA. I honor all of them and specifically call out Connie Walker, James Lowenthal, John Barentine, Ruskin Hartley, of course, Fernando Avia Castro and John, uh, John Barentine, and very last, Diana Umpierre. Thank you all for teaching me. I learn from you every day. So, our final reports, which took months to develop, write, and finalize, are now out at this website. And uh, if uh, Betty Maya could drop that into chat, please take a look. If time is short and you're not interested in the details, please look at the executive summary. But if you have the time and you're interested, say, in policy or in the broad range of communities, not broad enough, but we're beginning, uh, communities that we reached out to, let's take a look at the community engagement working group. If you're interested in the algorithms being developed to correct for this, take a look at the algorithms working group and so on. But I just wanna reiterate this point that this issue has not been around that long on the global radar, but everyone now is noticing SATCON trails in space. Uh, when we look up at the skies, whether they're indigenous knowledge holders or environmentalists or professional astronomers just trying to get a galaxy exposure or many, many, many other communities, astrophotographers, amateur astronomers, and so on. Everyone is writing, talking, and organizing around it. And so are we here today. So the next two slides contain points and images from one of the wonderful SATCOM2 uh, working group chairs, Meredith Rawls, who led the observations group. Perhaps you like to watch, like my teen sons do, like to watch superhero movies. And as you know, most superheroes' greatest strengths also ends up being their greatest vulnerability. Astronomy and our observatories are no different. Our best observatories, current and planned, turned out, turn out to be enormously vulnerable to light pollution from LEO satellites. For example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is being built right now 
and is going to give us the most high resolution and really wonderful map and ongoing movie of the sky, it's going to be amazing, is going to be particularly impacted by this light pollution threat. Um, so what are some of the light pollution issues from satellites? Here's just a few. Um, and then once again, I thank Meredith Rawls for some of these points. I'd like for you to file away uh, this opening point, which is that most of them right now in the orbits they're being launched to are mostly prevalent at low um, elevations in the sky near twilight. So usually dawn and dusk, but some are illuminated all night long. And the impacts end up being worst for some of the wide field, large all sky surveys that are based on the ground, very much like the Rubin Observatory. There's a lot of these streaks um, that I've shown you in previous images come from new satellites launching, sometimes old one deorbiting, um, but there's really a wide range of impacts. So some of the key recommendations from working groups and astronomers include now, I just need to give you a little bit of a context for the system. Like many other figures that astronomers like to get backwards, the magnitude system, which dates back a couple of millennia to Hipparchus, is backwards. So the higher the numeral value of a magnitude, the less uh, bright an object is, the dimmer it is. Sorry about that. But most human eyes see from magnitude zero to six, uh, where six is fainter and zero is brighter. Um, so we are asking industry and satellite operators to design to seventh magnitude or dimmer. That is our request. Um, there's also a request to keep satellite at lower orbits because higher orbits can sometimes make it worse. Now there's nuances in here. Like if you're a, a country like Canada that are is at um, you know, middle latitudes, you get particularly impacted by some orbital choices. Um, but for now, let me keep it simple and say that the current request to industry is to keep satellites at lower altitudes. You might think, wait a second, higher orbits, won't they be farther away and therefore fainter? That's good, right? Because everything's shining by reflected light. Well, actually, um, there turns out, and this was counterintuitive for me too, that the higher the orbit, the longer it takes um, to cross your exposure or field of view, because as you know, the farther away an object is from the gravitational field of something it's orbiting, the slower it moves, just like Neptune is moving slower than Jupiter, which is moving slower than Earth around the sun. These satellites at higher orbits, sure, uh, you know, there's some mitigation there being in a higher orbit, but they move slower. So again, there's a number of requests to industries, like can we please get accurate and precise trajectories for what you've launched and what you're planning to launch and some others listed here. But I wanna make very clear one key point for us here as a community, the IDA community. This is for individual streaks. That is important, but we can actually try to back correct for that, but we cannot back correct for other things the sheer numbers of satellites that are being planned, uh, the sheer numbers are could lead to, and people, very smart people, including John Barentine and collaborators, are calculating this right now. There could be a potentially large rise in the background global sky brightness, washing out the Milky Way, erasing up to 40% of meteor showers, and much, much more. Why is this important? Because unlike the streaks, which we could again, try to back correct for, we cannot ever get away from this. This will be like going to a planetarium show and dialing up, you know, like they kind of say, here's how it looks in the country and here's how it looks in a city. It could dial up the background brightness and we can't get away from it anywhere on the planet. So all of these dark sky parks, communities, nations that the IDA and so many communities have worked hard at, they may no longer be relevant. Uh, this will impact astrotourism, astrophotographers, amateur astronomers, and of course, professional astronomers. Now I need to integrate a lot longer to get data on my galaxy because of this rise in global sky brightness. So again, my gratitude to John Barentine and his collaborators for raising these excellent points that deserve more research.
from our industry colleagues and the industry working group that participated in SATCON too. I thank them for this figure. This is now a figure um, showing how Starlink's satellites, um, where they were peaking in visual magnitude, remember our eyes see zero to six. So from 2019, to 20, uh, sometime in 2021, they moved quickly to have mitigating solutions with darkening techniques. And I wanna point out the short timescale. I'm gonna come back to this because industry moves fast. In the time it takes most academics to read a preprint, get a cup of coffee and kind of look out their window, they've changed the design on their satellites. So they're willing to move fast. It is we, communities, and professional societies and astronomers that need to give them guidelines. So again, um, the darkening techniques are working. We are moving closer to the green line, that seventh magnitude that astronomers would like to see. So thanks again to Chris Hoffer and Therese Jones for sharing this with us. I wanna take one moment to honor another wonderful SATCON2 colleague, Richard Green, who led the policy group. Their report is wonderful, please read it. If all the legal, policy, environmental, and other issues, as well as international legal issues interest you. But a lot of their recommendations at the national policy level contain issues of interest to IDA. For example, environmental protection mechanism, environmental safeguards, sustainability, the preservation of dark and quiet skies. We'll talk about um, noise and light pollution in just a moment. But again, they are really, there are ways that all of us can come together, even if we are in very different fields with very different goals. We are all invested, even if I'm somebody who's in industry and I'm super pro the new space economy, we want space to remain accessible and we wanna avoid catastrophic collisions and debris. So again, there are ways we can come together. All right, so I'd like to spend now a few minutes on the wonderful working group that it was my honor and privilege to co-chair with James Lowenthal. Um, our working group, community engagement, this was a first for a meeting that addressed the issues of satellites and usually had astronomers and industry present. But with gratitude to the SATCON2 leadership, we were able to create an entire working group to bring in communities we had 22 members across all time zones in the world. And we focused on five groups that are listed here, um, five groups as a beginning to this journey. I wanna completely acknowledge that this barely scratches all the constituencies off there, out there, including artists, storytellers, culture, and so much more heritage. Uh, there are so many ways we all connect to the skies. This barely scratched it, but it was a beginning. And through many hundreds of hours and many, many interviews, surveys, and con conversations, we created a very large report, which is really six reports, these five groups reports, and then our summary, leaving the reader with these key takeaways. The sky belongs to and impacts all people and ecosystems. Space is a global commons, and if anyone's interested in talking more about that, we can in the Q&A. But in fact, there are many, many things, including the ocean and Antarctica and many other aspects of space that we are already treating as a global commons. Why not make it official? It's already contained in the Outer Space Treaty as well. The sky is part of the environment. Makes sense, right? but it has not been protected yet as an environment. And that has been how these launches have been able to happen so quickly because they are not bound by the rules of NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act and many other regulatory and environmental law concerns. The duty to consult was an enormous recurring theme. Everyone asked, well, I wasn't asked, how did this happen? Um, why wasn't I consulted? Uh, again, how can this be done in our name, for in, uh, in our name, for something and to something that impacts us all? And last, cultural scientific practices worldwide with shared skies. So we invite 
industry and space actors and leadership and really professional and uh, community rooted constituencies to co-create a shared ethical sustainable approach to space rooted in these values that have percolated up from the ground through all the communities we reached out to. And I know we've missed so many, but this is the beginning of a conversation. Some of our other takeaways, I've listed them here. I'm gonna amplify just a couple here today, but I wanna say that we really see this as the beginning of a journey because we know that's what's happening in LEO's low earth orbits is really gonna happen very quickly to the moon, uh, to asteroids and to a lot of near earth space because the principles by which, or I should say the lack thereof and lack of regulation that we're quickly occupying near earth space is going to quickly extend everywhere. So again, everybody wants more information and communication, more engagement with industry. Perhaps some of you, like most of my family, are Tolkien fans. So let me draw an analogy here. The industry moves fast. They are uh, you know, responsible to a lot of investors and a lot of timelines. They must launch at a certain um, pace to keep their licensing. So they are moving quickly. And we have been grateful for the industry, uh, uh, the industry, individual industry representatives and the individual companies that have been willing to talk with us. That's not gonna always be the case, but we are grateful for that, but they move fast. They are the Rohirrim of this landscape. Whereas, like I said, most of us, me included, by the time I have my second cup of coffee and have begun to kind of look out the window and dream about solutions, well, you know, you know, this kind of long, entish, you know, pace at which most of us are proceeding, there is a bit of a mismatch. So we need to all coalesce around shared goals as communities. What do we want for dark skies? And we need to pass that on to the Rohirrim so that the ball's in their court, okay? And one other point I'll amplify, there are so many other examples and industries we can learn from. I've been, been like listed just a handful here. And I also wanna leave you with, something that both astronomers and industry should avoid, um, which is to not have divisive dualities or kind of these false dichotomies. It's not a question of, well, if I wanna do science, you don't get your internet. It's not so simple. Scientists want and advocate for global broadband for everyone. Uh, and similarly with indigenous communities, many tribal nations would like the internet because they too want access to education, healthcare, and much more like the rest of us have. Uh, it's not just that they wanna preserve cultural traditions, they would like to preserve storytelling in the stars while having access to the internet. So all of us should avoid making this an either or proposition. I'd like to thank uh, my cherished colleagues, James Lowenthal and Diana Umpier for this slide uh, and the one after it. Um, which is the many, many arguments to consider space of the night sky as part of the environment. Seems so obvious, legally completely unprotected right now. Um, so what are some of the environmental impacts? Um, and James has beautifully organized this by all the different phases of launching satellites. In their launch phase, here are some factors, air pollution, noise pollution, falling debris, even from the launch phase, um, explosions, environmental justice and equity, which I'll amplify in just a moment. Um, very, very important. What, whose land are they doing this on? Uh, what are they doing to the people and the communities living around them? Are they listening and partnering before setting up their launch pads? During the operation phase is many issues I've already brought up. Um, so I'll let you read over those. Um, but remember this affects not just human life, but all ecosystems, including animal and avian life, navigation, migration. And last and certainly not least, the deorbiting phase. There's already a growing literature on the deposits of heavy elements and metals in the upper atmosphere and what that does to climate change. It is not the direction we want climate change to go, uh, what these deposits are doing. Reentry and deorbiting can often go wrong. Uh, they can either lead to like unexpected fall down of debris as we've seen this whole year, every now and then there's 
some like series of debris uh, that lights up the sky as streaks. So again, we need not just national, but international cooperation on this because there's more and more countries joining, um, joining the space stage, which is good, but we need international regulation and cooperation. So I want to just touch for a minute upon this issue of justice and equity. What might that look like in the skies? We know that we, this last 20 months, have enormously amplified the need for environmental justice, racial justice. These aren't new issues, but it's really raised how dire the need for us is, as we saw through the pandemic, which we're still navigating. As our colleague, Annette Lee, uh, who is Ojibwe Lakota, and a an wonderful artist astronomer and the founder of Native Skywatcher says, we are, there are some communities that are disproportionately impacted by the three Cs, colonization, climate change, and COVID. So how do we try to mitigate, address, create change that honors the burden these communities have had to bear? All of the wonderful work that IDA is doing through dark sky reserves and parks, which by the way, have enormous interest and a rapidly growing stargazing indigenous sto storytelling program um, data. They have an enormous base of programs that are growing out of this. That will all be impacted by a potential rise in global sky brightness. And as some of our working group members said, and I've mentioned a couple of them here, Hilding Nielsen, of the University of Toronto, who's Mi'kmaq, and Juan Carlos Chavez, uh, who's at the Blue Marble Institute, uh, Yaki Sonora. Uh, as they said, light pollution embraces indigenous stories and identities, again, disconnecting them from the night sky and bringing up all the pain of colonization again. Indigenous peoples and many cultures globally have millennia old complex relationships with the night sky and the stars. So who are we to take that away from them? And I point you especially to a growing literature and growing feature length media pieces on this. Some of you may have seen the New York Times piece on muskism just a few days ago, but also in the last few weeks, a long piece on low earth orbits being the next great crucible of environmental conflict by Josh Sokol for science, and also the role of satellite swarms in astrocolonialism by Becky Ferreira at Vice Media. Thank you to my dear friend and teacher, Diana Umpierre for this slide. As she has noted many times, and as I've tried to say here, this is not just a single issue, right? We are tugging on the thread of a very complex tapestry, a story that is still unfolding, a story that we are part of. We are not just going to address the one issue of SATCONS because it is tied to a million related issues. And Diana has done a wonderful job here summarizing light pollution on the ground and noise pollution disproportionately impacting minority and low income communities, the same communities that are often impacted by the three C's or by the rising ocean levels, light pollution, noise pollution, and so much more. So this is something that is a vast web of issues, but I invite your brainstorming, your dreaming, and your collaboration today. I'll wrap up with a few thoughts over the next 10 minutes or so, which is the impact on cultural practices. I'd ask you to kind of file away that currently most satellite streaks are being quite visible from the ground, tend to be low in the sky at dawn or dusk, which is soon after they launch. Um, now, what does this impact in particular? When satellite streaks are visible at high latitudes near the circumpolar sky, or when they're very visible close to the horizon, these impact a huge number of cultural practices. For example, calendaring practices, agricultural and fishing practices. So just like the three Cs impact the wellness, the very survival and the food sovereignty of many communities, the growing cycle um, and the fishing cycle and the agriculture cycle are impacted for many communities by a loss of the skies and stars. 
I draw your attention in particular to wayfinding, non-instrument celestial navigation practiced by the diaspora of oceanic cultures for millennia. Um, I keep, I also draw your attention to the fact that unlike the streaks that can in astronomy exposures can be back corrected with filters or software, this is real time observations. It is not going to be easy to back correct, particularly as the numbers build up. I want to also honor the story of the revitalization of Polynesian wayfinding. Um, this arose, and if anyone's interested in the story, um, I encourage you to investigate it uh, or ask me in the Q&A. But Nainoa Thompson, who was a leading figure in this revitalization of Native Hawaiian and Polynesian wayfinding, the current president of the Polynesian Voyaging Society and Po Navigator, he was able to do this through the wonderful oral tradition that had been passed down for millennia and learning it from Maupilag on the island of Sadawal in Micronesia. So as we begin to develop a new vision for defending dark skies, let's keep in mind that many, many communities and indigenous peoples have had a seamless scientific cultural integrative practice with the sky. It's not science versus culture for them. And they've been able to do it not through proposals or memos or um, journal um, publications uh, necessarily, but through oral tradition and very rich integral systems of knowledge curation. All right, so let's just be open to all human ways of knowing that leads to such wonderful scientific cultural practices. I want to broaden as we wrap up uh, uh, in, my, in this keynote talk. I want to broaden our view to other uh, issues. As I said before, the way we are approaching these low Earth orbitals is the way we are setting the sort of precedent for how we might approach the Moon, Mars, and really asteroids and a lot of space. So let's really put language and laws into place that honor the cultural value of everything we are exploring. These places have value regardless of what we do with them. And the Artemis Accords, which many of you may be familiar with, not very uh, many signatories yet, it's fairly US centric, um, but New Zealand, which is actually a relatively new but very active space actor, just signed the Artemis uh, Accords, but under conditions of Maori principles of stewardship and sustainability. So let's learn from that. And because heritage and culture are very important to IDA's principles, let's broaden our definition of heritage. Whose heritage? Is it just landing sites and boot prints? Uh, do places have value outside of, you know, what we're doing to them or what we're exploring? And I think, yeah, our answer is yes. They have far more value than what we do with them and to them. There's also an enormous range of issues and in the interests of time, I won't get into all of them, but please feel free to ask me during Q&A. We know that when it's a federal agency or a, um, a government actor, a, a nation, we can hold some of them accountable to us, the public and the taxpayers but we need to develop norms and policies around private actors in space because space is increasingly privatized. And also to all the legal and ethical scholars out there, we need you. We need clarification and creative solutions on a huge range of issues that are coming up, like where does earth end and space begin? What is the legal jurisdiction of earth's laws? How do we honor existing treaties, for example, between the crown and sovereign indigenous nations on earth, say Canada or New Zealand? How do those extend to space? Uh, how does this impact asteroid mining? Do some things get paid back into a sort of community trust from which communities can gain uh, from whatever we're doing in space? So we really need, we really need clarification and creative new solutions. And also to broaden the definition of planetary protection right now, it's very narrowly defined. And the concern has all been about biocontamination. What, are, what is gonna to happen to us? But have we considered how we change the environments we visit? The Asteroid Mining Act, which is just a few years old, um, Obama signed it. Um, it's a big gray area where there's a potential for life. 
But extending the metaphor of colonization, which by the way, it's hard to miss because a lot of the you know, uh, billionaires who are behind the current model of space exploration call it colonizing Mars. They wear cowboy hats to launches. So, um, but colonization has a painful history of consciously, you know, displacing, even eradicating those who lived there before. So as we go to these places, as we go to these places, we need to ask, well, what about the life that's there, but I haven't thought about? Um, that's a gray area that a lot of the current, you know, asteroid mining acts or other law needs to consider. And we need not just chief financial or chief, um, you know, uh, chief executive, chief financial officers, but chief ethical officers for these efforts. We need to expand these definitions to consider the ethical, cultural, and legal considerations from all affected constituencies. So in the words of Meredith Rawls, our choices today are setting precedents for how low Earth orbits in space will be used for decades to come, and in my mind, perhaps even centuries. Um, and um, could we drop this video link in, please? Thank you, Betty Maya. Um, the numbers from the SATCON2 reports are alarming for everyone, professional astronomers, communities, environmentalists, but I think we can turn this around we just need to start the work now. If we see dark skies as a fundamental human right, and we are interested in co-creating solutions. This is the re-entry of one of the Falcon Heavy spacecraft about two years ago. It looked exactly like this. This is not my picture, but it looked exactly like this from my backyard. I was actually for a moment a little worried and also intensely curious that the aliens were finally here. Um, yeah, so. You might be thinking, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? Um, well, um, perhaps a beginning point is consider if you're interested, it's hard to dig through actually commenting on all the filings and talking to your representatives in Congress. If you're in the United States, you're able to do equivalent versions of this in the countries and communities you're in. Please read all these reports. They are out and freely available. And there's talk now and growing, um, you know, kind of a growing movement to have a centralized institute, perhaps called SatHub, that will begin to address all of this from a shared scientific, cultural, environmental, ethical space. So we need you, all of you, not just the scientists, but the advocates, artists, writers, coders, everybody, we need you. Please join us. Um, I've written here a few points that IDA uh, has had a history, a wonderful history of building in, but we could year, really use accelerating advocacy and activism on uh, the cultural value of space and heritage, creative solutions from legal or environmental frameworks, really amplifying indigenous knowledge as a model of sustainable multi-generational science that is interdisciplinary. But because this is a global issue and an international issue, we need to build global networks to promote this advocacy because there's a dire need for coordinated international oversight and a regulatory ethical framework that honors all of us, the humanity, the ultimate stakeholder in dark skies. Space is our shared ancestor and it needs defending now. So I'll wrap up with a slide and an honoring coming back to where I began, which is elders and space being our ultimate shared ancestor. I wanna offer hope that despite all that is unfolding and all the crisis, we can do this. We are good at being creative. We are good at being interdisciplinary. We're a highly adaptive species that loves to explore and travel. We're good at being long-term stewards. And instead of having this anxious mindset of colonialism and the frontier and let's get out there and in the wonderful words of uh, Linda Tuhuai Smith, a Maori scholar, the manufactured urgency of how we're moving to space, let's take the long view. Space is our ancestor. We've always been there. It's also our future. And we can co-create a sustainable presence in space based on community not conquests or claims rooted in all human ways of knowing. 
So I want to end by honoring two particular colleagues with respect and affection. Paul Coleman, the first Native Hawaiian to receive a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics, and Kalepa Bai Bayan, both of whom were taken too soon from us um, in recent years, and Kalepa just earlier this year. The last time I saw Kalepa was at the American Astronomical Society meeting in January 2020 in Honolulu, Hawaii, where he taught hundreds and hundreds of people about uh, wayfinding in this wonderful setup that they had in the exhibit hall. I take a minute to honor them and their legacy, as well as their advocacy for skies. And Kalepa is shown here with his daughter, Kala, who also spoke at that meeting. We honor you, we honor your message. Here's a little one minute clip uh, that I will share with you and then I'll wrap up after that. And if that clip could be dropped in, thank you so much, Betty Maya, into chat. Draw a big circle around where you want to end up and then draw the map away. Draw your own map. Become the map maker, the cartographer for your own life. Don't let anyone tell you what you should be. Don't let others define you. Be responsible for owning your own dream and vision of where you want to arrive at. Be persistent and relentless in working that self plan so that you arrive at your destination. Eleanor Kalepa, who passed at the new moon phase, like my father, and I honor his family and his contributions. So thank you everybody for listening and for giving intentional space to these issues. I call on you, the current and future elders, how will we answer to future generations about what we did and didn't do at this critical juncture for dark skies in our collective history? Can we rise to the challenges and be the elders that the future deserves? And I point you to this wonderful quote by Paul Coleman. I offer the lesson of the stonemason. The greatest works require a tremendous effort with surprising patience, one stone at a time. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Arpana. That was just fabulous. And um, I, I would like, you know, to like have five or 10 minutes to just let it all sink in. But I've got a bunch of questions here. A couple of them are technical, and I want to start with those because um, a lot of your focus was on the satellite constellations. And there are a couple of things in there that are kind of counterintuitive. One is that um, why is it that the satellites at higher altitudes, which will look fainter, uh, potentially have as much or greater um, impact on the, the aggregate light pollution that we see? Oh, I'm be and before you answer that, I just want to, please don't raise your hand. Uh, if you want to ask a question, use the Q&A function that you'll find down at the center bottom of your screen. And uh, I will be, I and others will be picking through those for our pilot. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that kind of um, rushed by. Uh, yes, there's a few trade-offs here, but let me focus on one key one. Yes, so there's a, let me focus on the streaks first. Um, yes, you would think that because these, we are seeing the satellites because of reflected sunlight. And you might think, well, the higher up they are, the farther they are. Um, and so they'll be dimmer. And that would be correct, except because the farther they are, the slower they move. So they don't pass through your field of viewer exposure as quickly they linger. So that I would say is perhaps one of the leading factors. And if I've missed anything, there are some world experts listening in, you should totally feel free to add that into chat. But I would say that is the one that I would highlight. That's the individual streaks as far as you know, professional astronomy. The global rise in sky brightness, that is something that we are still working out. It is highly nonlinear from these hundreds of thousands of future satellites as collisions and debris build up. What is the, you know, how are these individual flecks of mylar and these individual 
you know, chunks of debris. How is that all going to play out? We don't know. We don't know. But just given what's already happening, it has the potential to be significant, perhaps even catastrophic. But thank you for that great question. And, and here's a related one, um, which is that um, uh, this is from Louise with 107,000 satellites planned. Uh, you know, what is the what is the rational spacing between them? How do you keep them from colliding together? And do we reach a point at which we cannot safely launch other space uh, spacecraft into orbit out of fear of colliding with these? Yeah, I think those are great points. And I want to just building on the previous question, there's some great additions, um, not just that, yeah, they're going slower, they're in an image pixel or the, you know, kind of exposure for longer, but um, the lower satellites uh, enter the shadow of the earth earlier uh, and the higher ones are not in the shadow as much. So they're, uh, they are actually, you know, again, kind of lit up for longer from all of these, these aspects. Okay. Um, so now uh, coming back to, to this question, is there any, you know, uh, logic and, you know, or, well, let me put it this way. Uh, right now, it's just been a, you know, the ITU is taking in all these filings internationally and the FCC is taking in these filings. The actual, the approval process right now is following some system but not adequately planning out ahead. Um, you know, this is my best understanding for all the known as well as unintentional consequences. And that's the big, um, the big issue is there is already quite a bit of crowding. Um, and I don't know, uh, you know, if somebody has this up, a number of us have this link uh, on Facebook for all the kind of unplanned corrections that Starlink is having to do in orbits, it's kind of interesting to track uh, on social media. There was a recent post about that. Um, that's something the company doesn't really draw attention to, just like it doesn't draw attention to its updates to its models uh, software for Tesla. We, it kind of doesn't draw attention to some of its corrections. Um, but I think that crowding is already happening. I believe there's a speaker, uh, thank you, Mike Simmons, uh, who will be speaking about it uh, tomorrow in the closing session. Um, but again, I think the, uh, a lot of the policy working group drew attention to the precautionary uh, principle um, and the crowding of low earth orbitals. I would say just based on a lot of recent testimony that you know Jim Bridenstine uh, comes to mind, John Barentine drew my attention to that. People are very, very worried about the crowding, but as it stands, there is some logic but not a lot of thinking out and not enough regulation um, for how things are being launched. Right now, it's just kind of getting up there, but there's already been an enormous level of concern about collisions and debris. Yeah. It needs more tracking, more self-reporting and more regulation. Thank you. Yeah, and of course, when the UN set forth its various space treaties at that time, this was decades ago, no one envisioned that there would be single indi individuals with so much money that they could have their own private space program and are therefore not bound by the UN treaties. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do wanna exactly, uh, I know we have a few panelists on and would anyone like to add to that? Because I, I bow to the deep expertise and passion that's present here today. Would <laughs> Connie or anybody? I, I think you've been doing a great job, Apar, and I'm not sure if I can add, add much more, but you know, it is really true that there are a number of satellite companies that are not within the US, like OneWeb in the UK, for instance, which is a major, major, and, they, and they've just filed for some more uh, you know, probably I think it was tens of thousands of, of satellites that they would like to um, uh, launch in the near future, certainly within this decade. And so we not only have to uh, um, partner with people with groups like uh, Starlink, but also with groups in China, like GW and other other entities around the world and who are not going to necessarily file an FCC filing. 
or you know, or maybe even with ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, they might not follow those people. They might just follow within their own countries, and that's it. And because they're only beholden to transmit to them in within those countries, so we have a lot of work ahead of us, and um, and we hope you will be uh, continue to be a part of it, Aparna. Thank you so much. Oh, it would be such an honor, and I, I I'll just amplify one point Connie made. I this the skies are global. And I think their regulation needs to be, and the advocacy needs to be global as a result. Uh, Rwanda just filed uh, for a 330,000 satellite launch plan. Um, and again, their plan is to use it for health and education. Uh, and again, you know, who are we to say yes to this and no to that country? We want everyone to be able to do this, but the sheer numbers are a concern. And the, the thing is, some things are going to get very hard to fix or back correct uh, once they reach a certain level of, you know, kind of a, a runaway, a debris buildup or congestion. And I see that somebody's put in like, uh, thank you, Tracy, congesting space, like we're congesting our highways. And I think this is why learning from other things like the railways, highways, how did we deal with regulation? How did we deal with planning and infrastructure is enormously important. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I, there are a couple of other questions here, but I'd like to follow a broader uh, topic that you touched on, which is uh, some research has started to show that light pollution and noise pollution disproportionately affects marginalized uh, and socio sociologically, uh, uh, you know, um, behind uh, communities. Is that primarily a U.S. perspective? That is to say, has their research been done on, say, developing countries where the arrival of, a, of electricity and being able to provide light at night is met with rejoicing? They, they, these are the communities that have the, a lot of the uh, lore having to do with the night sky, but in their mind, uh, the, you know, the arrival of the electric light far outweighs that. Thank you so much for, for raising that to the community. It sounds like you've synthesized a few questions on that theme. So I am learning as I go along. And I do think this is something that we need a vision for IDA from because it has such global ties and roots. Uh, for example, I think, um, you know, uh, in the opening introduction, Ruskin mentioned, you know, our IDA partners in India and some of the new initiatives there. Uh, and I, I would say my best understanding, and I thank uh, Diana and Connie and John and James for educating me on this, is that we need a lot more dedicated research on this. But I think much like the science versus internet or science versus culture was a, uh, you know, a sort of unneeded duality or dichotomy. I think, I think there's ways for us to have safe, clean lighting for communities and to minimize at the same time, light and noise pollution and access to skies. In fact, I would say there's more of a need for those communities who can't always get away on vacations to faraway places to have accessibility to dark skies. I think there's ways to do that. Um, to have safe, clean lighting uh, that follows some guidelines so that the access to dark skies is not, um, it's, uh, yeah, so that's what I would say. But again, I am in an ocean of deep expertise here. And if anybody wants to add to that, um, there's ways to do that, uh, you know, like I think to do both. But if anyone would like to unmute themselves from the panelists or to add into chat, I, I would love to learn also. But again, there needs to be more research on this, like what do developing nations need um, and so on. But again, it's also a health issue, right? The, the light pollute, we need lighting for safety, but that doesn't impact our health or ecological health. Um, while we wait for somebody to chime in on that, uh, a quick question from, from one of our uh, attendees from Val. How was the magnitude seven limit determined? Clearly, that's 
still way too bright to uh, to mitigate the effects of astrophotography and, and scientific research. Uh, it, it, was that a compromise between astronomers and, and the companies as something that could be achieved? Oh, um, yeah, so my best understanding, and I, you know, this is built up from before SATCON 2, which is when I joined. So let me say a couple of sentences, and then I invite Connie and others to to chime in if I've missed anything. So remember the, um, yes, it was a reasonable compromise that, you know, would be below the threshold of what's visible to human eyes. And as far as, you know, exposures or astronomical observations, we could potentially partner around for mitigating solutions. Again, for the streaks, not the global rise. Um, uh, keep in mind too, this is such a narrow part of the spectrum. I haven't even touched on all the other, uh, and it looks like the chat is kind of building on that, touched on all the other frequencies of which radio is only one. You know, all the other frequencies that are being impacted by the communication and the transmission. So I wanna honor that, that I've not spent a moment on that. But Connie, have I missed anything? Or James, Diana, have I missed anything? John Barentine, if he's yeah. present. Yeah, um, well, it was initially uh, determined from uh, staff at the Rubin Observatory with respect to uh, sort of a simulation of instrumentation testing that they had set up uh, to see how it would affect their um, upcoming uh, camera that they're gonna be uh, installing uh, uh, hopefully soon on the, on the Rubin. And it was um, determined not as a, a complete um, uh, remediation of of uh, any streaks on uh, the resulting images, but as a way of at least taking out the secondary effects, because there are typically uh, other streaks that occur for various reasons, you know, electronically and otherwise, uh, on an image due to a bright, you know, object that goes across the screen. And you know, when you're imaging, it becomes a streak uh, across your your photograph, basically. Uh, so. Um, so that they were able to, to I think with uh, other um, algorithms later on to remove uh, residual imaging, uh, image, I mean streaks, but not necessarily the primary trail. Uh, so it's, there's still a problem, but um, you know, there's always uh, other mitigation solutions that could come up in the future, so. Thank you, Connie. Thanks. James, any thoughts? Sure. Uh, Aparna, thank you so much for that lovely talk and for sharing so much of the credit. Uh, and uh, you deserve so much of it yourself. Um, uh, just to mention that the uh, the seventh magnitude number is really not a hard number. And uh, uh, industry has uh, has pressed very hard for for solid numbers that uh, that we astronomers could say, Okay, if you if you achieve this limit of, of faintness, we're going to be fine, or uh, something like that. And we can't do that because uh, certainly from the professional astronomy side, there are many many different kinds of projects, different kinds of telescopes, uh, different wavelengths, different uh, imaging spectroscopy, different cadences, and they all have different needs. Uh, so the seventh magnitude limit is a very very uh, broad brush. Uh, aspirational limit that does not even solve all the problems. And we made it very clear in SATCON 1 and SATCON 2, there is no combination, as you said, upon yourself, there's no combination of, uh, of mitigations that can actually solve the problem. The only solution really is to keep the satellites on the ground. But if the satellites are going to fly, please try to make them at least as faint as seventh magnitude. Yeah. Very much so, James, a compromise. And I want to return to there's the known uh, you know, issues that might come up, but I, I'm increasingly worried about the unplanned, unintentional fallouts of which debris is but one. 